So happy to be back here with you this evening. What a privilege it is to be here. Uh, I can't express, uh, really, it's, it's difficult to, to convey the feeling of uh, knowing uh, how good and how reliable and how sound this congregation is and how uh, important it is uh, that if I know that I'm not going to be here, that there is not one doubt in my mind that everything is going to carry on just as if I were here. The gospel will be preached. It will be preached in its truthfulness. It will be, uh, be preached boldly, and it will be taught plainly. And I'm so appreciative to Brother Jerry for that, and I know that you all thoroughly enjoyed that lesson. I looked at that outline, and I couldn't have done any better. So I'm very, very happy uh, that uh, I'm very happy that I'm very appreciative to Brother Jerry for that. So glad to be back with you this, this evening. What a privilege it was to be at Baker to do uh, the first part of the gospel meeting this, uh, this morning, and then I'll be there the next four nights. But I'm so thankful that I was able to come here. I told the guys over there that I'm preaching four lessons today, and that's wonderful. Uh, the more the merrier for me. I love it. I just love it. And so I'm so thankful that I'm here to do uh, this lesson here this evening. We're, con we're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. In chapter 9, we're going to look at verses 11 and 12. Before we do, let's go back, as we always do, and let's uh, review what we've learned in these first eight chapters. And then we'll look at chapter 9 and get into the text itself. We mentioned this morning in Baker, I mentioned this point uh, regarding Hebrews chapter 1 because we were speaking of Christ and how He is eternal and His creation is temporal. And we looked at verses uh, chapter 1 verses 10 through 12. And I, I said that chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews establishes three great truths. There's actually an uh, emphasis of one great, great truth. And that's Jesus is superior. Jesus is superior. Jesus is superior. Three emphatically stated declarations all the same, but all given a different contrast. Verses 1 and 2, Jesus is superior to the prophets. Verses 3 through 9 and 13 to 14, Jesus is superior to the angelic beings. And verses 10 through 12, Jesus, the eternal Christ, is superior even to his creation. It could not be stated more emphatically in one chapter to declare the superiority of the new contrasted to the old than to do so as the Hebrews writer did by inspiration. And that's exactly what we have. Chapter 2, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels, remember them? Remember the angels? Verses 13 and 14. For to which of the angels saith he at any time, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits? Sit forth the minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. Verses 13 to 14, yet once again contrast angelic beings. Have you ever wondered why they didn't continue on with verse 9? Jesus was compared to angels in verses 3 through 9. Why did they skip three verses and then go back? Because he's going to set the tone for the next chapter. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Listen, any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by who? Angels was steadfast. And angels are what now? In fear. If the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a what now? A just recompense and reward. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, this salvation was at the first spoken by the Lord. Salvation was spoken, wasn't it? It was offered via teaching, Titus 2, Acts 14, 3, Acts 20, 24, Acts 20, 32. It was offered by the word of God, the gospel of Christ. And all they had to do was hear it, believe it, and obey it. The same is true today. So chapter 2, Jesus is superior and you must listen to him. Why is Jesus superior? Well, that begins in about verse 7 of chapter 2, or excuse me, verse 5, all the way through verse 9, teaches that man is being spoken of, and then verse 9, it emphasizes Jesus Christ, who is made as a man, Philippians 2. This is why. Before I studied this chapter, before I studied this book, and we did these lessons, I had read Hebrews a lot. Now, I've read the other books a lot, but I didn't have the understanding that I now do. Why is Jesus superior? Not because he's deity. He's superior because he's deity, but that's not the argument, right? The reason why Jesus is superior in the book of Hebrews is laid out because of his role as redeemer, his role as priest. And that involved him being what verse 4 of chapter 1? <coughs> a man. For by an inheritance, how in the world could he be deemed Superior because of his uh, because of his eternal uh, because of his eternal nature. If it's by inheritance, 
The inheritance has to do with his, his lineage of Abraham and his perfect submission to God and his act as and role as Redeemer. That's, that's why. So chapter 2, you better listen to Jesus because of his role as Redeemer. He's superior. Chapter 3, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this man is counted worthy of more honor than, that, than Moses, or glory than Moses, inasmuch as he that hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, and the builder of all things is God. But Moses, for Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a, verse 5, contrast. Moses was faithful as a what? Servant. Verse 6, but, more contrast, Christ as a, what now? Son. Is there a difference between a servant in the house and the son of the house? Oh, is it there? And that's the difference here. Hebrews is a book of contrast, isn't it? Chapter 3, the contrast is between Moses and Christ. And guess what happened to those who disobeyed Moses? I love the logical, reasonable flow of this book. And the more I study it, the more I like it, the more I appreciate it. He establishes Jesus is superior, chapter 1. Chapter 2, this is why he's superior and you must listen to him. Chapter 3, he's superior to Moses. And guess what happened to those who disobeyed the inferior? The man. Guess what happened? Verses 16 through 18. And, uh, and with whom was he grieved? For forty years was about them who sinned, and the carcasses fell in the wilderness. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but they that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Could not enter in where? The land of Canaan, the promised land. You mean to tell me when they disobeyed Moses, who was a, a, a lesser mediator over a lesser covenant, that they couldn't enter the promised land? Yes. And the same is going to be true yet more emphatically if you disobey Jesus. Now that's just as powerful an argument as can be made. That's the argument. Chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Chapter 4 is about rest, isn't it? The fourth law given under the Decalogue was, Thou shalt observe the Sabbath. Go back to Exodus chapter 20. That's where it is. The Sabbath was given to a specific people, wasn't it? The nation of Israel at a specific time for a specific purpose. Deuteronomy 5. Those individuals that were released from Egyptian bondage, that's when they were given them this covenant. Remember? God would say, I made this covenant with them when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That's when. And this is who? The people who led out. So the Sabbath was given to the nation of Israel, and it was supposed to teach them. Just imagine if they would have understood. God released me from Egyptian bondage because I couldn't do it. Therefore, he's going to do some work that I can't do. So on the Sabbath day, I'm going to rest while God's what? Working. And if they would have just understood that, if these folks in the Seventh-day Adventist church today would just understand that, they missed it. They think we're still going to observe the Sabbath today. Folks, if we're to observe the Sabbath today, then Jesus failed to fulfill the law, Matthew 5, 17. And Jesus never failed one time. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly part, and you shall find rest for yourselves. Two times in two verses, he used the word rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Compared to what? Law of Moses. Christ gave rest, not the law. They missed it. Chapter 5. The priesthood. Human priesthood. Taken from among their own brethren, yet divinely appointed. Verse 4. No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So Christ also glorified not himself to be made high priest, but him that saith unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. As he also saith in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of the day. Who appointed Jesus to be priest? God the Father. Who appointed men to be priests under the law? By divine appointment. You couldn't be a priest on your own terms, Jeroboam. Sorry. 1 Kings 12, 31. You can't make priests of the lowest of the people and expect God. God will approve of that. Divine appointment. That's so important. If the world would understand authority as it pertains to religion, wouldn't it be a much, much more wonderful place? We would have such harmony. Chapter 6. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ and going on to perfection. That doesn't mean that you just cast them away, does it? But it means, it means you move beyond them 
in maturity and understanding and growth. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, it says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what verse 17 says? So verse 17 is a warning. A warning that you can fall from your steadfastness. The antidote to falling from steadfastness is growing. And the only way we're going to grow is if we eat. And the only way we eat is if we're nourished by the words of faith. 1 Timothy 4, 6, right? It's the only way. Nourish yourselves, right? And then take every opportunity to go to these assemblies and be nourished. And, and what do you got to do? What's your obligation? Prove it. Prove what you hear to make sure that these things are so. Chapter 7, the priesthood. But Chelsea, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Abraham gave him the tenth. He paid a tithe to Melchizedek, showing emphatically that this man was greater than he, and what he represented would be greater than any law, any priest coming from the loins of Abraham. And that's what you have, a foreshadow. Melchizedek was a foreshadow of the priesthood of Christ, an eternal priesthood, not according to the law. Chapter 7, verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the men received the law, what further need was there for another priest to rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity a change also of the law. For him whom these things speak it, Jesus, pertaining to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there rises another priest, made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. There's a difference. Oh, what a difference in the covenants. What a difference in the priesthoods. What a difference in the priests. Contrast. Chapter 8. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest that is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesties. We what now? Have. Wait, wait, wait. We will have. When he comes back to earth and establishes his kingdom for a thousand years? No, no, no. We have written in the late 60s A.D. In the late 60s A.D., guess what they had? A high priest. I argue that they had a high priest beginning in Acts 2 and A.D. 30. From that day forward, they had a high priest presently, currently. We got one now. Remember, if he's not priest now, he's not king now. And if he's not king now, then... Inspiration was wrong because inspiration says that his reign as king was tied directly to his priesthood. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. Even Peter, as he was preaching to those on Pentecost, would see that, would say, knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, speaking of David, that at the fruit of his loins he would raise up Christ and sit on his throne. This thing before he spake of the resurrection of Christ. Now, you can't remove that, can you? What God has joined together, man can't put asunder. Matthew 19, 6. And you can't do it either. You can't separate Christ, uh, the throne of David, from his resurrection and his ascension to the Father. It doesn't matter how much you want to. You can't do it. Chapter 8. A changed law. For this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their minds and write them on the hearts. And I'll be to them a God and they'll be to be a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. And I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And he saith, the new covenant he hath made the first old, and that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. A new covenant. Chapter 7, a new priesthood. Chapter 8, a new covenant. Chapter 9. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first one was a candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about it with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which things we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. How often? Always. Accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, with the high priest alone, how often? Once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way to the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service, that's the priest doing the service, could not make them perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. But Christ being become a high priest of better things to come, uh, of good things to come by a better and more perfect tabernacle, 
And then we go on into the text this evening. But Christ being become a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. This is a tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building, not physical, but something else. But, a contrast, right, to the previous verses. Verses 7 through 10. We just, we just quoted those. The high priest went along once every year into the second uh, tabernacle, but he didn't do it without blood. The Holy Ghost was signifying, the Holy Ghost was was telling us through this picture, through what this all represented, this symbolism of the Old Covenant and its laws and ordinances and its priesthood, it was telling, the Holy Spirit was telling us that the way into heaven was not yet made manifest because Christ was that way. Christ being come. This contrasts Christ's priesthood and tabernacle to the previous. The previous tabernacle was one made with hands, but this one is not of this building. This is the church, 1 Timothy 3.15. Being come is present tense. As we have proven conclusively, Christ was the high priest then. And the reason I'm saying this is because this pertains to when, the time frame we're talking about. It says Christ being come a high priest of better things to come. Now, was it, was it saying, oh, it's yet future, or was it saying it had already arrived? We need to understand that. Chapter 3.1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. They had a high priest win. Then. 4, 4, uh, 414. Seeing then that we have such a great high priest, present tense. You know that next phrase is significant. That is passed into the heavens. When did he become high priest? When he passed into the heavens. You know in Daniel 7 13, it was prophesied by Daniel all those years ago that Jesus would receive a kingdom and glory, and dominion, and he would do it when he ascended to the ancient of days. Now, when did that happen? Acts 1, and when did he receive the kingdom? Acts 2. That's easy, isn't it? Oh, that's so easy. God changed the priesthood and the law. The tabernacle was also changed at that time because the tabernacle pertained to both the priesthood and the law, and it was old and carnal, and it was only a shadow of that which was to come. So these were all changed. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now the things which we have spoken, this is a sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Now why did he say that? What's the true tabernacle? Is, is that, is that the, the tabernacle that they built in the wilderness? Is that the tabernacle that was built by uh, Solomon, 1 Kings 8? Is it the, the temple that was built by Herod? Or is this the temple built by Christ? This is the church of Christ. And this is not a building. It's a church. It's a kingdom. Chapter 5 and verse 5. When did this happen? So also Christ glorified not himself to be made high priest, but he that saith unto him. You know what I find? I find it so significant. These phrases that are used in, in harmony with each other. When? When did Jesus become high priest? But he saith unto them, Thou art my son this day, but I forgot me. Psalm, uh, in, in Acts 13 and verse 33, uh, Paul says the same thing about Jesus and this day he begotten him was when he was resurrected. Now, his priesthood is tied to his resurrection in more places than one, folks. It's all over the place. And if you miss it, it's your own fault. And these denominational folks, they miss it. So we need to be, we need to be ready to teach them. Show them the significance of his resurrection to his priesthood. That's when it began. When he ascended back to the Father. Christ, a high priest of good things to come, we need to know what this means. And this is a good opportunity for us because I'm going to show you how I've come to the conclusions that I have regarding what this teaches. How can we ascertain the truth of this? Number one, speaking of good things to come, is it saying from the Hebrews writer's perspective in the mid-60s A.D., late 60s A.D., that he's saying Christ is going to be a high priest of good things yet future for him? That it, it hadn't been realized yet at this time. Is that what he's saying? Well, contextually... We're speaking of Jesus, his priesthood, and the changed tabernacle, right? That's what we've been speaking of up to this point in verse 11. He is now reigning and has been since A.D. 30. Remember in Acts 2, beginning in verse 30, it says, Therefore being a prophet, which we've just quoted this, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. He would go on to say, this same Jesus hath God raised up wherever all witnesses. 
Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Now, I'll ask again, how long has he been reigning since, since then? A.D. 30. In Zechariah chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, it would say, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up out of this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Which temple did Jesus build? Physical? Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory. Which glory does he bear? Ephesians 3, 21. Unto him be glory in the church. And he shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. If he's not on his throne, he's not priest. He is on his throne, and he is priest, and he has been since Acts 2. When? Acts 2, A.D. 30. Point number two. The term good things to come is in contrast to the first tabernacle, which we've just been looking at. It's speaking of the time when Christ would be... Uh, a time of, or the time of Christ has been a time of reformation. Remember we, we talked about that last week? A time of reformation. A reform of what? Reform of God's law. A reform of God's tabernacle. A reform of God's priesthood. Chapter 7, 8, and 9. Notice. Chapter 9, verse 7. The holiest of all was attended by only the high priest at certain times. Chapter, eight, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 8. Yet the way to the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while that covenant was in effect. Verse number 10. All of this temple service would foreshadow something greater to come. That would be the time of reformation. Verse 11. This concept of verse 10, reformation, is synonymous with good things to come. What's the difference? What's the difference between time of reformation, verse 10, and good things to come, verse 11? We showed last week that this phrase, time of reformation, spoke of the gospel age. Remember Acts 3.21, Matthew 19.28? That they would sit upon their thrones judging the twelve tribes when? Uh, it would be in that time of the regeneration. And of course that is a reference to the gospel age. Titus 3.5. Number three. The New Testament very, uh, clearly teaches that this covenant is the institution over which Jesus is priest. He became priest when he entered into heaven. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, which hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither for us, or whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Don't miss this. His priesthood is tied to him going into where again, though? Heaven. Passed into the heavens. Chapter 4, 14. The forerunner is for us entered into the veil, and he became what then? A priest. There's some timing involved there, and it's connected. Could Jesus be priest under the Old Covenant? Remember, just a moment ago, we quoted Hebrews 7, 11 through 14. He could not be. Remember chapter 8? If he were on earth, he could not be priest. See, there are priests that offer gifts according to the what? Law. Jesus couldn't be a priest under that. Number four. This institution is a church. So what I've been trying to do in these last few slides is give you the reasoning why I believe that the good things to come is parallel to the times of Reformation in verse 10. And that's speaking of the gospel age. Not yet future, but was future from the, the sense of the tabernacle in the old covenant. The contrast, remember that. The institution is the church in Matthew 16, 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shall be loosed on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. He was given the keys to the kingdom, or excuse me, he was given this kingdom when he ascended to the ancient of days. Now here's Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I mentioned it a moment ago. Let's read it. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him, and there, and... And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. How? The church. How many nations? The nation of Israel? Is this a national religion now? No, no. That was a national religion then. This is universal. This is every man's amenable to it, not just the nation of Israel. Every man is. 
And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. When did he ascend to the ancient of days? In Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. They behold him ascending into the clouds. That's what he did. When did he receive the kingdom? When he ascended to the Father, he received it. Kingdom and glory and dominion. And that's what you see beginning in Acts 2. How do we know that this reasoning is sound? Well, we've just proven it. But let's keep going. Notice that the phrase in the text, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Greater and more perfect than what? Greater usually is a point of emphasis, a point of contrast, isn't it? If you said something is greater, then it's got to be greater than something. Well, I have something great, but mine's greater. So it's a point of, of comparison, and that's what you have here. Greater and more perfect is a point of contrast, and that contrast is nothing other than the tabernacle we had just been talking about in the first one. Thus, the time frame under consideration is now. Acts 3.21, the times of restitution, the gospel age. For the tabernacle made without hands is the church of Christ. In Daniel 2.45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. You know what that means? It's not of man's doing. Remember we just said that the, uh, the tabernacle was not of this building, not made with hands? What's the difference? Daniel 2.44 speaks of the eternal kingdom of Christ, the church, and it's made without what? Stone cut out of the mountain without hands. It's not, God, it's not man's doing, it's God's doing. More emphasis will be seen in verse 12. Verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The word neither tells us that this is also a continuation from the previous verse. Thus, good things to come, the greater and more perfect tabernacle, verse 11, has something to do with the teaching of this verse and the blood of Christ. The reason I mention specifically that point is that Jesus entering into heaven is tied directly to obtaining eternal redemption to us. Which is tied directly to his priesthood. Right? Synonymous concepts for us. Chapter 7, beginning verse 24. Do you know what we needed? We needed a, we needed a high priesthood. But we didn't just need any high priest. What if it was a man? What if it was merely a man? Could it have been just a man? I'm going to tell you why it couldn't have been. Even if he was perfect. Do you know why? For this man, because he continueth ever. For this man, because he continues forever. He hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to the uttermost to save those that draw nigh to God through him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7, 24, 25. A man couldn't have done it because a man's not eternal. We had to have a perfect and eternal high priest. And only Jesus could fit the bill. Chapter 9, 14 and 15. How much more by the, uh, by the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purged your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called, present tense, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. The blood of goats and calves. In Hebrews 10, beginning verse 2, it says, For then they would have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. If ever a sin was forgiven, it was forgiven based on the blood of Christ. Period. End of story. There has never, ever, ever, ever been a sin forgiven that wasn't predicated upon Jesus' blood. When Jesus was on earth, he could forgive sins. In, in Mark chapter 2, the man that came down and they, they lowered him down in the, the couch because he had a debilitating disease. And he said, son, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven. And they, and they said, who's this guy? And he says, that you may know that I have power to forgive sins. He says, take up your bed and walk. Jesus could forgive sins, but guess what that was based on? His blood. 
His blood and His sacrifice that was coming assuredly. The blood of bulls and goats would remind them every year. Remember we said, whenever we're speaking of the New Covenant, that the remembrance of sin didn't mean that He, did, didn't mean that he necessarily remembered the sins before, but it was for their benefit. They had to remember their sins every year because every year the day of atonement came. No more. Not in Christ. Once for all. Superiority. The offering of Christ did that, chapter 10, beginning in verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written to me, to do thy will, O God. Above what he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou uh, wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. How's that for contrast? He offered his own blood for us. Chapter 10, beginning of verse 18. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Contrary. But now, in Christ, ye who were sometimes far off or made nigh by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 2.13. This sacrifice is what obtained eternal redemption for us. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. Contrasted to the blood of animals and the yearly remembrance is the once for all offering of the blood of Christ. Chapter 10 and verse 3. Chapter 9, beginning in verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are figures. You know what that is? That's that temple. He had entered into there. He had entered into the tabernacle, the holiest. He had entered into there. He entered into what it represented, heaven itself, to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, not once a year, friends, not Exodus 30, not Leviticus 16, not the Day of Atonement, which this earthly, uh, infirmed priest would offer for himself. No, no. He didn't even go into the holy place. He didn't go uh, as a sinful man. He went into heaven himself as the sinless Lamb of God. For then he must have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The separation between man and God is now removed through Christ. No wonder he would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father except by me. He's the only one. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here tonight that have never obeyed the gospel of Jesus? If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus, you're lost and you're in terrible jeopardy. You must hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You must believe it, John 6, 29. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. You must confess Christ before men, Romans 10, 10. And you must be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. Acts 22, 16. This is when you're forgiven, Colossians 2, 10 through 13. And you must be faithful every day of your life. And folks, those who are faithful to God, we have wonderful promises that we can trust in. For those who have obeyed the gospel, are you faithful? We're going to sing an invitation song as we do. Please consider yourselves. If you need to obey the gospel, we'll study with you. We'll baptize you into Christ. If you need to come back to the Lord and you need prayers on your behalf, we'll be glad to offer them for you. Please let us know. The invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing. <coughs> Just as